Welcome to another episode of Cadence Fishing TV. And look at this for an absolutely stunning lake. It's Dudmaston Hall, which is near Bridge North. And the club have very kindly let us come here today to shoot a video and hopefully catch some of the beautiful tench that this lake's really famous for. So we got up early this morning. We know the forecast is going to be very bright and hot. And as you can see, I don't think there's any finer view that I've ever seen really on a lake. It's absolutely spectacular and it's just so exciting to get fishing. So we've had a good chat with Steve Williams, who's a good friend of Chappie. Chappie's done quite a few features here over the past and always raved about it. And now I can see why. So we're going to th keep things really simple. Um, fish traditional sort of style with a waggler. And Steve recommended that we start off, put some ground bait out to obviously try and attract the tension to the swim and take it from there. So that's what I'm gonna do. I've mixed up some balls of ground bait and I'm gonna throw them in. I've spent some time plumbing up and I reckon I've got around about four or five foot out there. So I'm gonna put some bait in about, I don't know, just four or five rod lengths out. So let's just see if Chappie can see that. I've got about 10 balls there. Um, there's a bit of hemp, some four and six mil pellets and some casters, so I'm just going to throw them out. A bit short that one. There we go. And there, uh, it's just so peaceful this morning. I've had quite a hectic week at work and I'm so looking forward to just relaxing and having a few hours fishing, hopefully catching a few nice tench. So Steve explained that Kimber Freeliners have got three different lakes on this beautiful estate and this is this is called the big lake and what's really interesting i think is the fact that the lake's not got any carping so what the club's done is try to keep it as a traditional tench lake which is quite rare these days and i think it's a it's a really nice idea obviously means you don't have to perhaps fish as heavy as you would if there was some big carp kicking about. And I just think it's an, uh, it is just the classic estate tench lake. So Steve had mentioned that apart from the tench, there's a good head of rudd, including some big specimens up to three pounds. There's also a lot of very small rudd that can be a bit of a pain if you're fishing with small natural baits like maggots and casters. So even though I've got a good selection of bait, I've got maggots, casters, I've got worms, um, I think we might find that we need to use baits like pellets perhaps to avoid the, the smaller fish, certainly fishing with a bit bigger bait. I've just started off with three maggots, three red maggots and I just had a little indication then so whether it was a a small one of those small rudd or a tench i don't know if you can see but i can already see some bubbles coming up which uh it's getting me quite excited Well, that didn't take long. I'd literally had two casts and I've hooked into my first fish and I'm taking my time because it's really fighting well. I'm fishing fairly heavy, but I definitely want to make sure I get it in the net, so I'm going to take my time. But it was the classic situation where 
we've got tinch bubbles coming up around the float and it's so still and calm. I'd got my float dotted right down and the float just disappeared so it was a really good positive bite. They're just such powerful fish tension and never seem to want to give up. And it's just starting to come a little bit now. Here he comes. Marvellous. <clears throat> That's what we came for. I'll just quickly unhook him. Just let him get his breath back in the in the water. So he's not a monster, he's probably I'd say he's about three, three and a half pounds. And um, it's absolutely beautiful, immaculate fish. It's got really big, massive paddle fins. I'll just hold him up quickly for you. So Chappie can see. Look at that, that's a, a male tent. You can see the muscles there by its, uh, just by its fit pectoral fin. Look at the size of its dorsal fin. And how fantastic. Well, that feels good to get at least one tench under our belt. And I just feel totally chilled out. Oh, that was a bite then. Know, I'm still on the maggot, so it might have been a little rud. But yeah, I just feel so relaxed and just soaking in the beautiful sun and the beautiful morning. I'm just fishing with a fairly light waggler to around about 2 AA. It's a, a loaded, slightly loaded waggler. And I'm just fishing with two number 10 shot down the line. Obviously there's no wind or tow today. So I just wanna, certainly to start with, just fish it with a bit of finesse and fill my way in to see if, uh, I, can get, I don't know if you could see that then, but I was just getting some indications and I almost struck. Obviously, tense fishing nowadays, you, you've probably got more sophisticated methods like perhaps fishing the pole or fishing with a, with a ledger like a method feeder, which is obviously devastating on its day, but I think every so often it's great just to have a session like this and just fish with a, with a float. So I missed another bite then, and that might have been those pesky rud that Steve was talking about so I'll try one more go with the red maggot and then I think if I get some fast bites I'm gonna change over to try perhaps a big worm and I'm, I'm not gonna lose feed too much to start with obviously I put a good amount of bait in and I really don't want to encourage the the small fish into the swim so if I do lose feed I think I'm just gonna lose feed with pellets uh, maybe some casters, but I'm going to be very careful. Well, the sun's lifted above the trees on the far bank now. I've had to put my hat on because the sun's really bright. It's going to be an absolutely beautiful day. 
And at the moment, I'm just getting the odd indication and there's still bubbles coming up. So I know there's still tench out there feeding. They're obviously rooting through all the silt and that's where they're kicking up all the, the gas in the silt and creating the bubbles. So I'm just uh, changed over to half a worm at the moment, just to give that a go. We've got some swans for company now. Steve was saying that the, the tench in Dudmaston go up to around about, I think, just under eight pound. And the average sort of size is three to six pounds. So they're lovely, beautiful sized fish. Apart from the rudd that I mentioned, they've caught some really big eels in here as well. So I think they're not really, I think they're allowed to night fish here um, just a few times a year. And that's when they come to, to target those big eels. But the, the lake itself was created when Dudmaston Hall was built. Um, Steve was telling me it was around about 200 years ago. And the whole area is just so beautifully landscaped. You often find with estate lakes like this that they can silt up over time. And I understand that there are deeper parts of the lake. There's a, there's a dam where it's much deeper, but we wanted to fish in the in this shallower water, obviously the the water temperature's up and the fish are feeding. Couldn't fish too close in because it's actually really shallow in the side. I've had to place my box out in the water so that I can get enough water for the for the keep net. And there's a little bit of a shelf, probably about, I don't know, two or three rod lengths out. So I'm just fishing past that ledge. And that was another fast bite. Doesn't look like my bait's been marked, so. It's great fishing sessions like this where you can, obviously in the summer with the long days, you can grab, grab a few hours before work and get some really spectacular fishing. I'm just making a few slight adjustments to my rig. I've increased the depth by about six inches. And I'm gonna put another number 10 on. My thinking being that this number 10 will just be sitting, sitting on the bottom and just help me register the bites if, if they get a bit tricky. I think I mentioned that first fish I had, the bite was a was a good positive bite. But always pays to just adjust the depth slightly and change your shotting pattern just to see if that'll make a difference. I mean, tench, they can be, you know, when they're feeding, they can be very easy to catch, but they can also be one of the hardest fish to catch. They can be so tricky and crafty. So I've actually got a, a 14 hook on at the moment and I'm thinking I might just change to a 16 in a bit if I'm not getting any more fish because I know the fish are out there, I can see them bubbling. And the lake itself is quite clear, so maybe the tench do get a chance to really inspect the bait and I might just have to fish a bit finer with the sun coming up and the brighter conditions. Well, just uh, one or two casts after making that change, I've just hooked another nice tench. Because it's shallow, the fish really do power off. You know, there's nothing else for them to do really. And Steve had mentioned that just to the right of me here, there's a bit of a snag, so I've got to be careful. There's a snag just outside that, that tree. But we seem to be getting this one under control now. I've, I'm using my CR10 13 foot 
number three match rod, which has got a lovely action as you can see, and it's got plenty of power when you're fishing for bigger fish like these tench. And I'm keeping the rod up because there's quite a lot of weed on the bottom and I, I want to try and keep the fish off the bottom. Got to avoid this swan as well. But I like to play the fish on the drag whenever I can. Because the fish are having to work for when they're gaining line, they're having to really work hard and I think you can tire out the fish a lot quicker than by backwinding. And obviously reels now have got such fantastic drags. This is a CS5 4000 reel. It's got a lovely smooth drag, so I'm just gradually tiring the fish out and hopefully we'll get it, it won't give up. Here he comes. Wonderful. Looks about a similar size to the last one, but I'll just uh, revive it in the net for a moment before I take it out and unhook it. I'm sure you could fish quite a bit heavier than this, you know, probably uh, a bigger hook and slightly heavier hook length, but. You know, when it is bright like this, sometimes I think you do need to find things down a bit. But if we start to catch, then I will probably switch to a bit heavier hook length and bigger hook. But I'm just going to hold that up for Chappie in the sun. And that's the target today. Absolutely beautiful tench. Well, that was on three casters. So I've been trying some different hook baits. I haven't managed to catch one on the worm yet. Obviously, it's great fishing a worm because you can get away with a bigger hook. And I'm trying to avoid those smaller fish, but at the moment, I'm, I'll stick with three casters on the size 14 hook. And I'm feeding just casters at the moment. I'm not feeding any pellets. And hopefully if the small fish don't become an issue, I'll just keep doing that. I think sometimes when you're fishing for tench and you're feeding lots of different baits like pellets, corn, hemp, the fish can actually become preoccupied on one type of bait. And if it's a small particle, then that's obviously difficult to, to fish. Certainly with a hook that would be strong enough and well, strong enough to land the fish, so I'm just happy just feeding casters at the moment. I think that duck is as well, he's enjoying a few. So what I've been doing, I've been actually trying to fish this side of that ground bait that I put in at the start. Um, I'm trying to sort of, if I do hook a fish, guide them away from the, the rest of the tench in the shoal. And also, I think if you're fishing right over the ground bait, sometimes you can get lots of false indications from the fish, line bites. So I reckon that's where I put the ground bait and I'm just coming back about half a rod length. So just one turn of the reel. And obviously as the session progresses, if I'm not getting bites there, then I'll go further out, might even try past the ground bait. I didn't throw the balls in too accurately and I, I did that on purpose because I wanted to spread the ground bait in a, in a general area. Didn't want to feed it too tight. I just had a, a period, probably half an hour, where I'd lost a fish. I think it was foul hooked. It wasn't on for very long. And I was just experimenting. I started, apart from the cassas I'm feeding, I started feeding some small six mil cubes of luncheon meat. And I just thought I'd try a piece on the hook and I've been rewarded with a fish pretty much straight away. So that's interesting. On the maggot or the caster, I was getting bites and indications. I think perhaps a combination of smaller fish and also 
line bites from the tench, but it's quite nice doing that, just trying to a change bait. I've only probably fed 10 or 20 pieces of meat, and this tench obviously took a liking for it, and we've got another wonderful tench on. This one went on a really powerful run when I hooked it. Must have, must have gone about at least 15, 20 meters out. Might be a little bit bigger than the others. I don't know, perhaps it's a similar size. He's just got a bit of attitude, this one. Maybe a fraction bigger, perhaps Nudging four pound that one. Well, there we go, I think it, that one is a bit bigger and I think that one's a, a female. Look at this paddle of that dorsal fin. Absolutely amazing. And it is proving a bit tricky. They're not easy to catch. I'm having to really work and change my baits and presentation slightly. But it's great fun and I just love these short sessions before work. It's just great to get your fishing fix in the, in the day and maximise the best time, which obviously is early in the morning in the summer when you're fishing for tench. This was straight in after that third tench, took this, this fish and again on meat. So I'm pleased I tried that. It was uh, something Steve had mentioned to me when I called him and quizzed him about the, the fish in here. Um, I talked about corn and Steve said that a lot of people have been fishing corn and maybe the fish are a bit wary of it. So I'd got some meat that I'd chopped up from river fishing at the weekend that I'd kept, so I put that in and the tench definitely seemed to like it. It's obviously a great bait because it's a bit more selective than perhaps fishing with maggots and casters and worms to just help avoid those smaller roach and, and rud. Here he comes. <laughs> it's beautiful to see them in this clear water there. They're just such amazing fish tench. So powerful for their size. And that one was just, just hooked in the top of its mouth, so it only just nicked it. Absolutely beautiful. Another male look, it's got that big muscle there and I mean what a wonderful session and what a beautiful venue to fish. Well the sun's really out now and we're gonna call an end to this wonderful session just to quick fish this morning. Um, before I pack up I thought I might take you through the tackle that I'm using and also actually tie the rig so it's really clear how we're doing it. Um, I mentioned the rod and the rod's the CR10 13 foot number three. We do that rod in three different powers, one, two and three, and three is the most powerful. So when you're fishing a bit heavier like this for big fish like tench, it's an absolutely perfect rod matched up with the CS5 4000 reel and I've loaded that with four pound 
Pro Gold line, which has a diameter of 019. So it's robust enough, uh, particularly when you're fishing on days like this, when it's quite bright and you're fishing in the day, you know, having a bit more finesse with your tackle is definitely a big advantage when you're tench fishing. Um, I mean, we all carry a multitude of different floats, but these are the kind of floats that I've been looking at selecting from today. They're all peacock wagglers. They're made by the company called Drake. I've got some insert ones and some straight peacock wagglers. And today I went for this one. So it's actually a semi-loaded float. You can see there's a, a brass insert in the float and I'm using a Drennan float adapter. So obviously I can change the float. I can change the size or the style of the float without having to completely break down. And this one is basically um, seven number four plus five number four which means it's like a, a 2AA float and it's semi-loaded, so half of that capacity is in the float. And all I'm gonna do is attach the float to the line. And what I like to do is, I actually like to pinch on these BB shot very gently. They're Drennan sorry, Dinsmore Twin Cut Shot. And they've got a nice coating today. You can actually move them on the line look without damaging the line. So that's really good for a non-toxic shot. So I've got my two BB shot there. And then I'm gonna get some number eight shot, which in this case are lead, because you can use lead number eights. When I'm putting these shot on, I like to put them on at the bottom of the line. Now I bite them on, I know that will probably get me into trouble with someone, but I like to bite them on the bottom of the line because obviously when you bite the shot on, you can damage the line. So what I want to do is bite the shot on at the bottom of the line and then move them up the, slide them up the main line. So I'm just going to then discard the bit of line that I attached the shot onto. And now I've got perfect piece of line that's not been damaged in any way. And I'm actually going to put one number eight on the other side of the BB at the top. And that's just to help prevent that shot from moving. It's nice to have a little bit of a gap there between the bulk shot so the waggler can move. And when you're casting that helps and when you're striking it just helps so the mag waggler can move freely. So I'm just going to test that in the water. Now you can see that's, don't know if Chappie can pick up on that, that's pretty well dotted down. But the way I fish today is I've had to have a really sensitive float. So what I've actually done is added more shots. So it's just a little dimple really. So I'm going to put another three number eights on. So you might wonder why put so many number eights on the line? Well, it gives me more flexibility in the presentation. So I can make a small bulk of shot if I need to. I can spread shot out. I'm fishing a deeper peg. If it's windy, I can get more lead down the line and achieve the perfect presentation I want. And now I'm going to pop two number 10s. No, let's say three number 10s. And these are going to be the dropper shot today. So all those number eights at the moment are just going to stay around underneath the float. Um, just to add flexibility to the rig if needed. That one was missing a slot. So again, I'm putting them on at the bottom and sliding them up. And then we'll quickly check that and see how that looks. Now that's more like it, look. The float's really dotted down. If I was to put another number eight on that float now, that would sink. 
So I've got maximum sensitivity there. And now I'm going to show you how I like to attach the hook length. And I've had quite a few questions about this and people have asked me. So I thought in this video, we've got some time. I'll actually do it nice and slowly. So the hook length that I'm using today is this Vespro 016, which would have a, a braking strain of around about three and a half pound. So again, it's giving me the, some finesse in my rig. You know, the tench, it's clear water. Um, hopefully that's going to be fine enough to fool them, but strong enough to get them out. And I'm going to pull off about, about two foot of line for my hook length. And this is where I like to do what I call the figure of eight knot. And hopefully Chappie can pick this up. But what I'm doing is I'm holding the two lengths of line together. So I've got my hook length here and my main line here. Put them together and then I just wet them, which just helps to stick the line together and also helps to lubricate the knot when I make it. And then I put, my, put both of those pieces of line around my two fingers like that. So now I've got a loop effectively. And then I put my finger inside the loop and I twist it two times. And this is the tricky bit then. Grab the two pieces of line and pull it back. And what you'll notice is, can you see, it's, it's an eight, figure of eight, or like a pair of spectacles. That's what you've got to achieve. And I think this is such a fantastic knot because it's so strong, but also very, very neat and small. So I prefer to use this knot over loop to loop for nearly all of my fishing. So I'll just wet that and then I'll pull that together. So that's what you've got to achieve is that figure of eight look. Gently pull it together and then cut off the, the tag ends. So I just, hopefully you can see that. Such a wonderfully neat knot. And I think that's a massive advantage for most of my fishing. I use a loop to loop knot when perhaps I'm fishing short hook lengths on the pole with baits like bloodworm or when I'm bleak fishing. I've got that nice long section of hook length now. I'm gonna select my hook. Where did I put them? So these are a census 3180 and I've been using a size 16 and that's enabled me to push a variety of baits so two maggots, three maggots, casters, worm and also those cubes of meat. Now I'm going to show you how I tie the hook. So this is a adrenaline hook tire. I mounted the hook in the vise so that the point is upwards and the bottom of the spade is facing up. Again, I'll just wet that. And basically this is just the standard whipping knot. So I bring the line together at the top of the spade and then gently just whip down. Now there's no hard and fast rule as to about how many twists you need to do. But you need to match it to the size of the hook and the diameter of the line. So I've probably gone around there about 12 times. Nice, neat whipping. Wet it again. The line goes around that peg and then you just gently pull forward. So now the knot's forming behind that whipping, nice and secure. And you take the hook out the vise and you pull the tag end back through and that forms the perfect spade end knot. So you can see the line is coming off the front of the spade. Well, I hope you can see it anyway. And then the tag end is coming out the back. You just want to just tighten it up gently. That's an absolutely fantastic, neat, strong knot. Go on, I'll use some scissors this time and trim it right down to the... That wasn't very good and put the loose ends of line in my tackle box. So there you go, perfectly tied hook. Now I do tie hooks to nylon when I'm match fishing and for when I'm fishing in the winter and it's cold. But this time of year, I just like that. I like to have an extra long hook length. So say I want to change that to a, a smaller hook, an 18, I just bite that hook off and then tie another hook straight onto that line. 
So I'm not messing about putting more line on, you know, as long as that hook length's not damaged, I can attach more hooks to that. And I think that's a, a great way to save time as well. So I'll just quickly show you how I had the rig set up today. It was around about five foot deep. And the best rig was just fishing on the drop. So I just had two or three number 10s. One number 10 just above the hook length knot and one sort of halfway between that and the float. And that nice long hook length to really help present the bait beautifully and try to trick those tension to take in the bait. So there you go, a very, very simple rig, but hopefully just by showing you that and showing you the nuts, you can actually see how we were fishing today. Okay, great. So let's have a look at the bait that we've used today. So I brought myself a couple of pints of nice fresh casters, um, just a pint of red maggots, some four mil hard pellets, and I just had a I don't know, a quarter of a kilo of worms. And this was the meat I was talking about. So this is chopped up six mil cubes of luncheon meat. And what I've been doing quite a lot on the river is I've been adding fish meal to it. So I'll prepare that the night before and then put a dust in of fish meal on it. And my thinking there is I want on a city on a river, I want the the fish meal powder to absorb some of the fat from the meat. And what that does is I think it makes the meat sink a bit quicker. But what I found is obviously it's a great attractor to the fish as well. So I started doing it on lakes and it definitely worked today. It got us a couple of fish in really quite tough conditions. So actual hook bait wise, I'll show you how I hook the different baits. Three casters. Great thing with a caster is you can bury a lot of the hook inside the bait. So, you know, when it's clear water like this, you can actually hide a lot of the hook in the bait. And I had a fish on three casters like that. So you can see how they're presented, trying to hide the hook as much as possible, but actually leave the point showing. So you've got a chance of, a, if you're having fast bites, to connect with the fish. Um, I've shown this in many of our videos before, but when I hook a maggot, if I'm putting more than one on, I like to hook them very lightly through the tail of the maggot, so not the blunt end. And in this case today, I've been using three maggots like that on the size 16. I mean, it is a big size 16 hook, you can see. That's a wonderful bait when you're targeting bigger fish like tension bream. And I'll show you how I hook the worm. So nice to get a nice, decent dendrobina worm like that. And I like to cut them just below the saddle of the worm. So I'll show you that. And then actually thread the hook into the broken end. And again, hide the hook as much as you can. So that's the, where's he gone? He's, he's got a saddle of the worm there. And I think that for me, the most attractive part of the worm is that head and saddle. I think that's got to be the best bit of the worm for the fish. And I honestly believe, especially when you're using chopped worm, that fish like bream and tench will hunt out those bigger, chunkier bits, particularly on a hard day. Obviously, when it's fishing well, it doesn't matter. And quite often what I'll do then is I'll get a bit of the tail like this and pop that on as well. So what I've got is I've got a nice, attractive bait with two bits of worm. So again, I'll thread that on. Okay, so the key thing now is that point showing. See how lively the worm is. And if I'm not getting pestered with little fish, I'll often just tip that off with a caster. Now, that's not really gonna do anything in terms of the bait, I don't believe. It, what it's doing though is it's helping keep that worm away from the hook point. If, the, if the, one of those bits of worm can fold over the hook, you can pull out a fish because the hook's not penetrating in. So that's another favorite bait of mine for tension bream. I mean, what could resist that? And then I'll just show you simply the meat. Great thing about this hook is you can use all these baits, swap between them. And all I do is just hook this on. So I just put the point in the middle of the cube of meat like that and then 
push it round nice and gently. So you can see most of the hook's hidden. There's still a bit of point of hook there that's going to hopefully help the hook penetration if you're getting tricky bites. So those were the different baits today. Hook baits, I didn't use any hard pellets on the hook. I could have done by banding one, but I just felt today the fish were really keen on casters, maggots, or those bits of meat. Well, that's been an absolutely fantastic morning session at Dudmaston Hall. And I've got to thank Steve Williams for letting me to fish as his guest today and helping out, showing us the different pegs. And I just love fishing quick sessions like this early in the morning in the summer. I can get off to work now and catch up with some orders. And I'll tell you what, this is a venue that I'd love to come back to. I just wonder if I could catch another guest ticket off Steve sometime. I'd love to come back on a more overcast day when it's not as bright and fish into the evening as well. So I'm going to get these absolutely beautiful fish back now. I'm just going to try and release them just so you can see them. And there's one. Just ending up with four fish today, but I pulled out of a couple and I think they were, they were foul hooked. They were definitely a bit sneaky today. But these, these fish are absolutely beautiful and in fine condition, so I just let them go back. They've got plenty of uh, the boss in the sand, the, those swans about anyway. And here's the last one. I'll just show you that one. Absolutely amazing. What a wonderful day. Thanks for watching.